So I'm going to start with this. What do you get when you cross Utopia with YouTube? You get Utubia, an idyllic island in the middle of nowhere that you need a bridge to get to. Now, if you're a fan of S. Scott Fitzgerald like I am and you've read his novels, you might recall a very minor event in this side of paradise in which the main character, Amory, and his friend Tom de Invilliers commandeer a couple of bicycles from the campus of Princeton University and ride in the middle of the night to the nearby town of Lawrenceville, five miles away. Now this occurs at the end of chapter two, a chapter called Spires and Gargoyles. A very brief vignette that describes Amory and Tom riding through the darkness while debating whether to rebel against Princeton's traditions or embrace them. With Amory, whom critics identify with Fitzgerald, arguing that they should embrace them. Just go with the Princeton flow. Now I grew up in Lawrenceville. I've lived in the area practically my, my whole life. And for a while I've had in the back of my mind that I should try to reenact this ride. Same time of year, same time of night, same road. Perhaps this stems from the fact that the novel was published on my birthday, March 26, 1920, 101 years ago. Also the fact that I have a YouTube channel might add just a little impetus to the undertaking. It's kind of like catching a marlin. If you're not going to hang it up, take a photo, and show everyone, what's the point? Now, this is a work of fiction. Even so, I like to imagine that Fitzgerald, at some time during his stay at Princeton, had the gumption to get on a bike and ride in the middle of the night with a friend down to Lawrenceville. At least when I do the ride, I'm going to imagine that I'm riding not in the tracks of Amory, but in those of Fitzgerald. So here's the setting. It's June of Amory's sophomore year. Classes are winding down, the alumni are in town for reunions, and Amory and his friends are just biding their time until the summer break. They're staying up late, shooting dice to dispel the boredom, and one night, Amory and Tom get the notion to scrounge up a couple bikes they don't even know who they belong to and ride down to Lawrenceville. It's 3.30 a.m. Now a note on the route. In the novel, Fitzgerald calls it the Lawrenceville Road. In my day, I've always known it as Route 206. Prosaic? Yeah, sure. But I will say this. Along its entire length, all five miles, it still retains that same old-fashioned charm that once inspired the pen of Fitzgerald. Even at night. Especially at night and I hope to convey this in my video. And there it is, Nassau Hall, the most iconic building on campus, namesake of Nassau Street in the school fight song, Old Nassau. And here is Princeton, enveloped in quiet, some might even say a cloistral hush. Nassau Street is fairly empty. I can see my truck over there, my Ford Ranger, black as sable, one with the night. And what I have here beside my bicycle is a little bit of red wine to fortify myself for the journey. Fitzgerald wrote nothing about Amory and Tom drinking before they left, but I've added it as a tribute to the author who coined the toast, here's to alcohol, the rose-colored glasses of life. All right, so let's begin. Let's showcase this town in all its somnolent glory it survived the repeal of prohibition. There's no reason why I can't survive the legalization of pot. Now, first and foremost, 
Up here on the left is Holder Hall. Holder Hall is where Amory and Tom found the two unlocked bicycles that they would borrow for their ride down to Lawrenceville. Now in all my time living here, I never knew this was called Holder Hall until I saw it in the novel and I looked it up. But as you can see, it is quite prominent with lots of frontage along Nassau Street. It's got this tower looming in the darkness. It's got the quintessential Princeton look. And on the other side, it has a cloister and a courtyard where any medievalist would feel quite at home. And if you want to see them, just go to my music video, Princeton University Snowfall, and they are featured right at the beginning. Next, we have the intersection of Nassau Street and University Place. Fitzgerald wrote that when Amory first got to Princeton, he went straight to his new digs at 12 University Place. Fitzgerald described it as a dilapidated old mansion. Now that address, 12 Univ as the novel called it, no longer exists. And I can only assume that like Poe's House of Usher, it has collapsed into the tarn of progress. So now I'm coming up on the end of Nassau Street and the beginning of what Fitzgerald called the Lawrenceville Road. And while I'm still steeped in this atmosphere of Princeton tradition, I'm gonna ask a very basic question. What kind of a novel is this side of paradise? Everyone's read The Great Gatsby. Very few people have read this other novel. Now we know H.L. Mencken, the foremost critic of the day in his review of The Great Gatsby, wrote that this side of paradise was the better novel. He dismissed Gatsby as a clown and the other characters as marionettes. Even the New York Times wrote that this side of paradise was, quote, a nearly perfect novel, unquote. So what's my verdict? I think that it's a good readable novel. I'm not gonna compare it to The Great Gatsby because that's like apples and oranges. Fitzgerald published four novels during his lifetime and each one reads like it was written by a different person. I will say this, that my favorite chapter is chapter one, Amory, son of Beatrice. I even like that title, Amory, Son of Beatrice. Fitzgerald is being ironic. He's being funny. Something utterly lacking in his other three novels. In fact, the whole chapter is sprinkled with humor. And if you don't believe me, just read his description of Beatrice picking up Amory from summer camp in a battery-powered auto that only goes three miles an hour. So if you haven't read the novel, just go to a library and take out a copy. And speaking of libraries, we're coming up on Library Place, the most exclusive address in Princeton, looking very hushed and quiet at this hour as befits its name. And so now I'm going to cue the music, and in a little while I'll be making a slow and somewhat winding descent down to the bottom of a shallow valley through, through which runs a brook called Stony Brook, and once across I'll check back in with a word on the theme of the novel. So I am now across Stony Brook. I'm at the top of a very steep hill and I got about a mile stretch of road ahead that'll bring me up to Province Line Road, which is the intersection between Princeton and Lawrence Townships. And I'm gonna take the time to weigh in on the theme of the novel, 
because I think it's relevant to what's going on today. And I'm going to start with Amory's Catholicism. Now, Amory's mother raised him a Catholic, not a devout one, but she gave him enough Catholic sensibilities that they intrude on his thoughts and even his philosophy. Now, Fitzgerald too was raised a Catholic, and I have no doubt that in this respect, the author mirrors his subject. So throughout the novel, Amory tries to reconcile his materialism, his desire for wealth, for fame, for romance, with his very tenuous faith, and his mentor, a priest by the name of Monsignor Darcy, senses this tension and gives him cautionary advice along the lines of, you cannot be a romantic without religion, or you cannot completely lose yourself in the desire for someone else. Ultimately, by the end of the novel, this advice will go unheeded, and Amory will strike out on his own with neither faith nor church as a bulwark against whatever challenges he might face. And the novel ends with what I think is one of the saddest lines to end a novel with Amory lifting his voice to the skies and crying, I know myself, and that is all. And I believe that when the epitaph for America in the 21st century is written, it will echo Amory to wit. We knew our identities, and that is all. And on that note, I will cross Province Line Road and into Lawrence Township. I'm just outside of Lawrenceville right now, riding through that distinct half-light before dawn. And just this gentle rise will bring me into the village proper. And as I ride down Main Street, I'm going to do a little now and then comparison exercise. I'm going to identify each storefront today, and then I'm going to say what it was back in the 1970s. Not that this is relevant to Fitzgerald just something I know because I grew up here. So first we have a Starbucks where once there was a Texaco gas station back in the day, days when station wagons ran on leaded gas. Next a restaurant where a hardware store once sold everything from paint to ten penny nails followed by a pizza place where I remember a shoe store stocked floor to ceiling with kids sneakers. The pharmacy unfortunately is vacant. It was last a bagel shop. The post office is now a restaurant and good old Bentley's Market which used to hang a can opener outside its front door so you could pop open your 10 cent can of cola is now a restaurant. So you can see the town still has a lot of character just of a very culinary nature. Now I'm going to pull into the main entrance of the Lawrenceville School. It has a fountain flanked by two iron gates 
And I'm going to use this as an imaginary turning around point for Amory and Tom. Now, Fitzgerald wrote very briefly of their ride back to Princeton. He wrote that they recited poetry to the bushes. Specifically, Amory recited Ode to a Nightingale by John Keats. Now, this is both poignant and prophetic, given that in 1934, Fitzgerald would publish a novel, Tender as the Night, that takes its title from a line in that poem. And the line is, Tender as the night, and happily the queen moon is on her throne. So it's sunrise and I'm back in Princeton, the same time Amory and Tom got back. And Fitzgerald wrote that when they returned, quote, the sun made colored maps of sky behind the graduate school, unquote. So I thought I'd end at the graduate school. It's about a half mile from the main campus and it overlooks the university's golf course and features a prominent tower, Cleveland Tower named after President Grover Cleveland. And so I will stop at its base and hope my thoughts, my concluding thoughts, will find inspiration in its four lofty spires. So I'll take a moment to pan the golf course and pan the tower. And then I'll reverse the camera for my official coda. Reenacting this bike ride has confirmed something that I've always thought. That there's a duality between Princeton and Lawrenceville that's unlike anywhere on earth. I know that's a sweeping statement, but I believe it. You got the big town and the big school, and then you got the small town and the smaller school, but both schools have these global reputations and they're connected by this five mile length of road, a road by the way that runs the entire length of New Jersey, yet has this one tiny stretch that boasts the attention of the most romantic novelist in literature at the start of a career that would end in the pantheon of the greats. It's no exaggeration to say the towns complement each other like Goethe and Schubert, or Newton and Einstein, or even Wolf Trap and Jacob's Pillow. I've traveled a lot, I've lived in other places, but this is the only place I've found that is commensurate to my capacity for wonder. Anywhere else would be exile. And I'll close by quoting, in Latin, Princeton University's motto, Dei sub numine viget which means, under the protection of God, she thrives. Now that's a beautiful motto and it bears repeating. Dei sub numine wiget, under the protection of God, she thrives. It was true in Fitzgerald's day. May it be true today and for many years to come. For all you Fitzgerald enthusiasts, you will appreciate a discovery I made during the course of this project, both the discovery and the serendipity that made it happen. But before I divulge what it is, first a little background. In this side of paradise, Fitzgerald writes very little about Amory's professors at Princeton. The fact that Amory even had professors is barely touched upon. Remember, Amory's mentor was not a professor, but a priest. Monsignor Darcy, who is based on Fitzgerald's own mentor, Monsignor Sigourney Fay, namesake of Daisy Fay Buchanan, and whose funeral, he passed away in 1919, is fictionalized at the end of the novel. I think it's safe to say that Fitzgerald did not want to burn his bridges at Princeton, and so professors were off limits, to an extent. Here's an exception. 
In chapter four, a chapter called Narcissus Off-Duty, Fitzgerald describes Amory in an English class as a professor rambles on about Victorian literature, Victorian poets to be more specific, from Tennyson to Swinburne to Browning, while Amory, who has begun to blame the Victorians for World War I, scribbles satirical couplets at their expense. The professor has no name, nor is any other description given, just a disembodied voice. And yet with so little information to go on, I believe that I can identify this professor, and he is buried here in this cemetery in Lawrenceville. Now this discovery happened quite by accident. On the same day I filmed my sunrise visit to the graduate school, I was driving around Lawrenceville, had some time on my hands, and I decided to visit my parents' grave. It had been a while since my last visit and it just seemed right. And now I will reverse the camera and describe exactly what happened. So I sat on this bench next to the headstone and for five minutes I paid my respects. Then I got up to leave. And as I was walking away, four graves caught my attention because each grave was inscribed with a poetic epitaph. And I began to read them. I laid me down with a will is from a poem by Robert Louis Stevenson called Requiem. There's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England is from The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. I to the hills will lift mine eyes from whence doth come my aid is from Psalm 121. I was so taken aback to see the final grave and read Thomas Mark Parrott, Professor of English, Princeton University, 1896 to 1935. I instantly thought that not only was this Fitzgerald's English professor, but that he must be portrayed in this side of paradise. Why? Because coincidences only happen for a reason, and I would not have discovered this grave on this particular day unless it was connected to the novel. The first thing I did was Google his name. Wikipedia provided two distinct clues. His doctoral thesis was on Robert Browning, and secondly, he published a book in 1901 called The Greater Victorian Poets. His specialty was Victorian literature. Then I combed this side of paradise for any scene that mentioned a professor, and I found the one cited in chapter four. Now, I'm not going to say this is all conclusive, only that it's fun to imagine it so. And here's a final word on his epitaph. This is interesting. He lived to be 94 years old, probably read every book ever written, was as scholarly as they come, and when it came time to sum it all up, what does he say? The long day's work is done, and we must sleep. The same words Mark Antony said when he was about to fall on his sword. Now that is just so erudite. Mm -hmm.